Hey everybody, this is Tanner Steed. Welcome back. I have some excellent news, some fantastic news, some news I can't wait to tell you. I am officially a full-time artist. Woo! I'm not sure if you already knew that, but um, I had been working uh, a few jobs here and there. I had a full-time job previous to this, and finally, finally I made the jump. And I wanna tell you exactly how I did it. Um, I'm so excited. There's so much that went into it, but now I'm finally here, so I wanted to share that with you. There are so many different things that I did prior to going full-time as an artist, but I have narrowed it down into just five things that I'd like to share with you guys. So, number one, let's start out with personal dedication to the craft, an intrinsic motivation to get better. So, for the longest time, I was always someone going to work and in every single break of my day, during my lunch break, during my 10 minute break, or after work, I was drawing and painting. I was trying to get in art at any point in time that I possibly could. Where I made the most growth was actually bringing a sketchbook on my lunch breaks. I don't know about you, but during my lunch break, I only had, let's say, 30 minutes, okay? What I would do is I would actually grab my sketchbook, run to my car, and hide hide from anyone else so I had the time where I could practice drawing. I would draw from life, I would draw the things that I found around me, and then once I did that for uh, quite a long time, I would actually pull up Instagram and scroll through and find drawings that I found absolutely incredible and try to do little master copies. Um, even with that short amount of time, doing it over and over and over again, I saw the growth right in front of me. It was really exciting and it just fueled me to continue doing it more. I'm a very goal-oriented person, so I ended up making many, many different goals, but one of them was paint 100 paintings in a three-month period outdoors. So outside of work, on the weekends or just after work, I would actually go outside, bring my easel outdoors, and paint on location, which is an incredibly difficult uh, way of developing, but that rapid failure really showed me growth. In fact, my first oil painting ever was outdoors. Um, it was in at Waterton Canyon near Denver, Colorado. Someone gave me incredible advice recently that I wish I knew way back then, and that is, if you want to master something, you need to do it for 10,000 hours. Well, this person actually said, you know what? It's not 10,000 hours. Think of it specifically for art, 10,000 paintings. You need to start and fail, start and fail. It's that rapid failure that really helps you grow because so much of art is actually what happens in those first few hours, the introductory stages of a painting. So really, I would highly recommend rather than spending 10,000 hours on something on very long projects, start over, start again, um, and try things new. One rule that I had for myself actually was that uh, if I was scared to draw or paint it, that was my next subject matter. And that's how I was actually introduced into roses. All right, so I was getting outdoors, I was plein air painting, and uh, in addition to that, I started researching different art schools. And uh, for me personally, I couldn't fly to the Florence Academy, or I couldn't go seek out some of the academic training that I really, really wanted. So I said, you know what? That's not gonna stop me. What I did is I looked at their curriculum. What were those instructors teaching? And I said, you know what? What if I took that curriculum and I tried to teach myself? Yes, maybe it is much easier to have a teacher in front of you, but being someone who worked full time and wanting to grow as much as possible, I needed some kind of uh, tangible, incremental growth. So that's actually what led me to cutting out pictures of barg plates and putting them in my sketchbook. So wherever I was, I was practicing rendering proportions and trying to capture some of the academic training that was happening at uh, ateliers around the world. Now, obviously, when you're doing this all the time, it comes up in conversation with the people around you. Well, eventually, I received my first commission, and my commission was to do a painting for a longtime family friend. 
and I was really excited to do it uh, because it was my very first commission. So I was actually going to be paid for my art. I thought that was ridiculous. That was so cool. So um, I did my absolute best and it turned out pretty good and they were really happy and it really opened up my eyes that, oh my gosh, this could not only be a hobby, but what if I dreamed, what if this could be the career for the rest of my life? I could turn something that I love doing in every single moment of my life into something that I can pursue every single day. What was so incredible about this realization was that I was drawing and painting regardless of if I made money. I wanted to get as good as I possibly could because I had such an intrinsic appreciation for the craft itself. And uh, I, I had the drive and I still have the drive to improve as much as possible. The monetary value of my work is second to the process. I am All right, so that brings me to number two and that's being persistent. I guess I've developed a very persistent personality uh, for better or worse. <laughs> but when I care, I really care. When you're drawing and painting and you're looking on Instagram and looking at other artists, getting art books from libraries, you come to find out that there are other artists in the world. And some of those artists are not only absolutely incredible and masters, but who knew it? Some of them live nearby. I had no idea uh, until I started looking into it and appreciating artwork that some incredible local legends live in Denver, Colorado. And they're not just local legends, they're internationally known for being masters of their craft. Amongst all the artists that I was appreciating, one in particular stood out to me, and that was the artist Daniel Sprick. He is an exceptional painter. He is, dare I say it, as good as Vermeer, Let's just say he has honed his craft like no other artist that I know. He works every single day to improve his craft, even now at the age of 68. I think he's 68. I would uh, analyze his artwork. I would do uh, sketches to copy his compositions. I would even print out piece, parts of his painting to do master copies with in my sketchbooks. I found them absolutely mind-blowing. I had no idea that uh, that kind of work and that level of mastery was actually possible. So when I found out that he lived in Denver, I was like, oh my gosh, I have to reach out to him. And I thought, you know what, how am I going to do it? Um, maybe I'll, I'll ask him for a to take him out for a cup of coffee, that'd be awesome. Or uh, buy him lunch, or um, maybe, I don't know, how am I going to meet him? Well. Um, eventually, I found out that the plein air convention was going to be happening in Denver, Colorado. So I was like, perfect. He's faculty at the plein air convention. I'm going to pay the price of the ticket just to meet Dan. Well, guess what? The conference was canceled multiple years in a row thanks to COVID. Well, that didn't stop me. <laughs> to say the least, I was extremely persistent. I had to meet Daniel Sprick. So I sent him multiple emails and I asked him, hey, can I take you out to lunch? Can I um, get a cup of coffee, buy you some paints? Um, just anything, just to meet him. Because I really, really look up to him. And eventually, after I, I think it was three emails, he emails me back, which was the most exciting day of my life. When Daniel Sprick had responded to my email, I was freaking out, so excited. Well, I, you know, I assumed, okay, sure, you can take me out for a cup of coffee. No, instead, he invited me to his studio. And when I got to his studio, I was so nervous because I had looked up to him for such a long time. I had seen videos of the inside of his studio. I've seen his PBS documentary. I knew exactly the layout of everything in there and so many of the paintings that I saw. So I walk it, I, he opens the door. I'm totally starstruck and he lets me in and I get to watch him paint for uh, at least an hour. And then after that, we sit down, we have a conversation, and that was the beginning of the best thing that could have possibly happened to me. And that leads me to number three, which is community. While I was with Daniel Sprick, 
Um, I didn't just go there and talk with him and ask him some questions. I brought in all of the work that I, or evidence of all of the work that I had been uh, pushing through over the past year. I showed him my bark plates. I showed him my sketches. I showed him uh, paintings that I was working on just to show him how much I cared about painting, how much I cared about art. And he looked over my sketches. He looked over my bark plates. He seemed to be pretty impressed. At least, I can't, I don't know for sure for the artwork, but certainly my dedication and all the amount of time that I was personally spending. He really could tell that I was being um, not only persistent, but I was very dedicated to learning. So as I was leaving his studio, it was the coolest day of my life. Rather than saying goodbye, he said, we'll be in touch. And I was so excited by that. I had no idea that this was going to be something that turned into something incredible. Eventually, a few days pass, Dan invited me to come draw with him one night and in some kind of sketching group. And I'm like, cool. All right, I, I'd love to, that'd be fantastic. I'm thinking, you know, a couple people are going to be there, maybe him and a couple of other artists and a model. This is gonna be fantastic. I was really nervous, but I was really excited. So um, I go to his studio that night with all my drawing gear, I'm ready to go, and I open the door, and not only is it Daniel Sprick, but so many, a huge collective of artists that I had been looking up to for so long. I was so nervous. So being a very introverted person, you may not know this, but I, I was very quiet um, amongst all these people. And I was like, holy crap, I need to do the best drawing I could possibly do. Not only did I draw, but I got to watch Dan work again uh, from life. And uh, it was one of the coolest experiences ever. And after that night, I went home with a reasonably good drawing given the circumstances, and um, as I was leaving, Dan said the same thing, we'll be in touch. I was like, what? This is not a one-time thing? Are you kidding me? So eventually, he invited me back, and ever since that moment, I have been a regular participant in this drawing group, this painting group, um, and it's the craziest experience of my life. Um, through this group, I have been able to meet artists that I have looked up for up to for so long. Both artists that are local in Denver, but also traveling artists from around the world. It has not only given me incredible opportunity to grow my network, but these people are now my friends. These are friends that I draw and paint with who I call if I need anything. I We can go up into the mountains, go paint there. I am invited to their house. Um, we have them over for dinner. It is the wildest thing. And all due to being persistent and getting to Daniel Sprick and <laughs> trying to, um, to meet my now mentor. So Dan has kind of taken me under his wing and he is, I'd consider him my mentor. He's been helping me uh, immensely. And thanks to him, I have an incredible community, an incredible support system that I could not have made this jump without. Okay, so with all that being said, um, I had to be realistic. I had to plan for the fourth thing, and that is my finances. I needed to make sure that I could actually financially do this. So I had a community. I had the dedication, I had the persistence. Well, I needed to make sure that I wasn't just going to make the leap and then assume that money was just going to come in. Um, I did a lot of planning. Essentially, I created a marketing plan for myself. I needed to figure out the legs on my table that were going to make sure that my table is stable. So the legs on my table, I'm developing this YouTube channel and I'm starting to make money from it, which is fantastic. So thank you guys for being here um, and thank you for liking and subscribing. I really appreciate it. Um, I couldn't do it without you and the channel is growing. It's so exciting and I'm going to be coming out with more videos. I'm also doing personal painting sales and that's through my website. It's through uh, personally uh, curated shows for me to show my artwork. I'm selling artwork while I'm plein air painting. I'm selling them off my website. I'm doing many commissions, which is a huge percentage of my income. 
Um, and then I also just got such an incredible opportunity to teach at the Art Students League. What's incredible about teaching art is actually that when you are teaching it, you are also learning. So it goes with the dedication of the practice and if I always have a rule for myself and it's a general idea. If you can't explain it to someone, then you don't understand what you're talking about. If you develop the language to describe something that you're doing accurately or inaccurately, you're actually able to see more. So by teaching, I'm actually developing that language skill to be able to identify issues in other people's work and my own so that I can avoid problems and solve them more easily. Being financially balanced was really important. I also started selling prints on my website, so if you're interested in any of those, just go to tannersteedart.com um, and you can get originals as well as prints. Um, I'm really excited about those. I found a local company that is doing incredible work on high quality watercolor paper. Uh, it was really important to have not only a marketing plan, but to you know balance my budget, make sure I could afford it, and uh, I decided that it was time. I was working uh, a full-time job and working as a full-time artist. Uh, I was doing commissions and making a ton of painting sales on my own and it actually, something had to budge. Either I had to quit my job and move on or uh, something else had to move around. But obviously I dove into art and I'm so excited that I did so. And with the YouTube channel, I could not be doing this without the person behind the camera, my wife, Brittany. She is absolutely incredible. She edits all these videos. She reaches out to my network. She sets up my workshops. She contacts my students. She is doing a ton of the business. So I am so grateful that I have a teammate that has been doing so much for this business. Without her, there's no way that I could be making this leap. Absolutely not. She's done so much for me. Last but not least, number five, I am so lucky. I am so lucky by just the simple fact that I was born in the place where I was born, the opportunities that I have had over the course of my life. There, there's so much that happened behind the scenes that uh, brought me to this point. I have family support. They are all very supportive of this decision. All of the networking that I had prior to even getting into art in the first place, all of that has been kind of a foundation that I shouldn't take for granted. I can't take it for granted. Um, many of those people that I knew in past hobbies and past experiences are now commissioning artwork. Um, and I had no idea that they were right there. Living in Denver, Colorado, I had no idea that I was going to be living down the street from Daniel Sprick's studio. Insane. I'm so, so lucky. So those are my top five. One, you gotta have personal dedication to the craft. Two, you need to be persistent. Three, you need to build your community. Four, you need to have a financial balance and plan uh, your finances, because you have to be realistic about it. And then five, you need to be a little bit lucky. So thank you for watching. Make sure you subscribe, and I'll see you in the next one. Just about to go film that now. Thanks.